If you have your worship folder, I want to invite you to take that out. Uh, we're going to go through inside there. There's a listening guide with some fill in the blanks. And we'll kind of walk through that during our service today. Uh, we mentioned quite a few times that uh, we call ourselves a faith family. And we would love to be a faith family uh, to you. It's a place to gather around our faith and our growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, our family, I know you all have a biological families. We just want to be part of the faith family. My biological family started like most. Um, my wife and I, we got married and we were living in Norman, Oklahoma at the time. And life was good. We, we'd go to bed whenever we wanted. We had jobs. The place was always clean. We'd go to, there's a place called the Waffle House. Um, if you've ever been there, you know what I mean. If you haven't, you're not missing much, so don't worry about it. Uh, but we'd go at 2 o'clock in the morning just to, just to hang out together. And we had very little stress. We had money. Life was good. And we thought, why don't we throw all that out the window and have some kids? And, and, then, and then let's buy some dogs. And let's just, let's just make our life as stressful as we can do it. And so we did. We had three boys and we adopted a girl later on in life. Um, and with, our, with the birth of our first son, Tanner, he was actually the one playing guitar and singing today, uh, we, we were going through, we never had kids before, and so we signed up for, well, we, <laughs> we didn't sign up, she signed us up for these things. They're like, they're called La Mama class or La Maz or La Mia or some kind of class. And you go to, it's like six weeks long, and you go once a week, and you go to the class, and they teach you how to have a baby, which angered me from the beginning, because I paid a crazy amount for health insurance. I'm like, I'm paying you to have the baby. Just tell us where we need to be. So we go to this class, and I had been working all day. My wife's so excited. She's like, we got our class tonight. And I'm like, yay, can't wait. We drove all the way into Oklahoma City to this hospital place and met with a bunch of other guys kind of in the same situation we are. And one of the very first things they did was they taught us relaxation techniques. Um, and I'm a pro at that. I'm like, I don't need a class to teach me how to do that. So I had been up since 6 that morning and worked all day, go to this relaxation class. They turn off all the lights. They put on this soft music, and they're like, let's practice our breathing. And so we're all like, there's like, I don't know, 20 people. We're all laying on the floor practicing our breathing. And I, I was asleep in like 30 seconds. I was out, <laughs> which that wouldn't have been so bad, but I was snoring, and that was kind of frowned upon. You're not supposed to snore during those things. So I got in some trouble for that. Uh, but during that class, we learned that I had to pack a bag. I'm not sure why it was my responsibility. I think just to give the husband something to do, but I had to pack a bag that we would take to the hospital. Inside this bag was like chapstick and a sucker and like a focal point and all this stuff. And I'm supposed to use that during labor. Um, and I, I knew that this was important because everyone was talking about it, but I didn't really understand the significance of it. I just kind of did what I was told to do. Well, as we were getting close to the due date, um, she, would have, uh, she would have contractions that weren't really contractions. They're like Braden Hickston or something like that, Bryson something. And they were like, I don't know who that guy was, but he probably got fed up with his wife saying she was in labor and she wasn't. So they named these after him. And so I'm like, it's probably just those things again. We're not having a baby. We're not, you know, this is not the time. And then her water broke. And I was like, oh, okay, so I guess we're doing that. Um, and so we, we go, and my job is to get the bag, this important bag. I'm not really sure why it's important, but I'm supposed to bring this bag. I bring this bag. We go get in our minivan because we were cool parents. She, Every dad has to buy a minivan at some point in your life. If you're in that stage, it, it will pass. Trust me, you'll, you'll call the junkyard to take that thing off at some point. But we had to get the minivan. And I didn't have gas in the minivan, so we had to stop and get gas on the way to the hospital, which evidently that's frowned upon too. That's probably not the best thing, but, you know, it was good. And I got into a conversation with the guy in the gas station, and that's frowned upon while your wife's in labor in the car. This is all a very true story. Um, and so we get there in the hospital. They check us in, and the one thing um, 
I know that labor is tough on women, but it's really hard on men. And here's why. Because, just hear me out. How come you people don't go into labor at like 10.30 in the morning or like 1 in the afternoon? Never that. It's always like midnight or 1.30. And so it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. We get to the hospital, and she, uh, she starts going into labor, and they, we put her in this, they put her in this room. And what they give the guys, and if you've had children, you understand, uh, with the money that you pay, they give you this couch chair thing that's the most uncomfortable piece of furniture you'd ever sit in in your entire life. And I'm supposed to sleep in that. I'm like, I'm tired. I'm going to practice my relaxation techniques, and I'm going to go to sleep. So she's in labor. I fall asleep, and that was frowned upon, too. She's like, you should be awake if I have to go through this. I'm like, okay. So I did what any normal dad would do, is go down to the cafeteria to get something to eat because I was hungry. And so I went down, and I got me, like, this big noodle bowl and all this stuff, um, and I brought it back up to the room. She, was, she, could, she could eat. She could have ice chips. I'm like, those are just as good. And I brought them to the room, and that's frowned upon. Um, I got in trouble for that, too. And so I was kind of frustrated. I'm like, I've had a really rough day. Can you keep the labor down just a little bit? Because we got to do this. we got to have this kid tomorrow. And I was all focused on that. About 7 o'clock the next morning, the doctor comes in. He's like, you ready to have a baby? He's all suiting up, putting his stuff on. And I'm like, oh, the bag, like this is my time. And so I go grab the bag and I pull the, the chapstick out of there and I like walked up with my sweet husband voice. I like rubbed her hair. I'm like, here, honey, here's your chapstick. I'm not kidding. This crazy woman smacks it out of my hand. She was like, that was for last night. And I'm like, that's just a little detail. No one told me. And so we didn't use the sucker. We didn't use the chapstick or anything. I knew it was significant. I just didn't know how significant. But once I understood that, the next babies went a little better. We had C-section, so it was a little bit easier. Uh, but I, I just I understood the situation. Once I knew the significance and once I knew the reason, it literally changed everything for me. Um, now, I would argue that the resurrection is a lot like that. We, we know it's significant, right? We talk about it all the time. We started, um, golly, I want to say like January or February planning for this Easter weekend. And we had Good Friday services and we had the Easter egg hunt. We have a couple services today. The worship team has been practicing for weeks. And we put all this effort into the resurrection. And so we know it's important, but let's be honest. Why? Like, like what is it? that's important. I know that anytime someone comes back from the dead, that's significant, but why? It's not like I can go um, after lunch today. It's not like I can go have a sit down conversation at a coffee shop with Jesus. It's not like that all of my pain and suffering is gone. It's not like that the loved one that died is going to bodily come back to life in this next year. And so when you look at the resurrection, you would say, I know it's important, but how does it really affect me? And once you understand that, once you understand the significance of the resurrection, I would argue it changes everything for you. So my hope today is just to show you in the few minutes we have why the resurrection is so valuable why it's so important to us and why our faith hinges on this day that we celebrate in the resurrection of Jesus. So if you have your listening guide, I want you to take that out. We're going to fill in some blanks as we walk through it um, to see the relevance of it. In order to do so, we kind of need to go all the way back to Genesis. We need to go all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible when God uh, created the world. Adam and Eve were in perfect harmony together. Everything was wonderful. And then three chapters in, we're at the beginning of the creation story and sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, that's when everything began to fall apart. That's when things crumbled around us. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Um, here's what we realized that sin fractured our relationship with God, that we were in perfect union. We were in perfect harmony with God. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden, but then sin fractured that. And that relationship was broken. So what does God do? God 
through his love, removed us out of the garden. You're like, well, that doesn't sound like love. But think about it. Now, what God had created for man to live forever, for everything to be perfect, um, and sin broke that. Now, if we live forever, we live forever broken. And God didn't want that for us. And so the garden was, we were removed from the garden, and, and man would eventually die because he, God didn't want us to live forever in that broken state. And that's the beauty of the garden. So after that, God declares judgment on sin. He has to judge sin, right? If God just lets it go, he would not be just. It would be a bad God. He would be a bad judge. You can't just have things happen, have sin enter the world and not deal with it. It's like if you're raising a kid, there are things you discipline for for your children and you don't like doing it. Um, it's a pain to do it sometimes. And the, the worst thing is when you put a kid in timeout, um, it's harder on the parents than it is. Just like labor is harder on the husband than it is on, I'm just kidding, not, not really. Um, it's hard, right? Because you put them in there and we always did this thing. If you're like, if you're five years old and you get in trouble, you got to go sit in timeout for five minutes. Well, someone has to time that, right? And because like our first kid, we left him in there for like three days in timeout. And, <laughs> and Tanner wasn't smart enough to tell times. He's like, it's been three days. I'm still in here. Not really, but close. Then you have to go back and then you have to explain why you did it. So you don't, you don't like judgment for sin, but you understand it has to happen. In the same way, God doesn't like judgment for our sins, but it has to happen. It's something that, that the creator of the universe must do for you and I. So he declared judgment on our sin. He just said that sin now has a judgment that comes along with it. And you and I were a part of that. And what's crazy when you read through Genesis, the world was burning. I mean, it's falling apart. Sin had ruined everything. And in the middle of that, God says, I'm going to redeem this. I'm going to fix this. And we know, because we're on the back part of the story, that he fixes this through Jesus. Um, but since God knew that we couldn't keep the law perfectly and that that judgment was going to continue, God established the sacrificial system. And here's, here's what the sacrificial system did in simple terms. It made it so that we could approach God through the substitute of a sacrifice. So if we had wronged God, if we had sinned, if we offered a sacrifice, the sacrifice paid the price for that sin and we can kind of mend that relationship with God. And this went on for a long time. Every year on the Day of Atonement, they would take the sacrifices that people would bring. So if we lived back in those days, you and I would come to the temple and we would bring a sacrifice. They would sacrifice that animal. They would put the blood of that animal, some on the altar. They'd put some on a, a second animal, which was called the scapegoat. They'd put the blood on that goat, and they'd send that goat out away from camp, kind of taking the sins of the people outside of the camp. That's kind of the imagery that was there. Every single year this happened. And they, just like us, we got so good at it that, that we could sacrifice things and it wouldn't really change our heart. We were just going through the motions. So sacrifices meant if, if you sin and now it costs you something, the next time you're not gonna be as likely to sin because it may cost a sacrifice. And it's a beautiful system. The problem is we kind of found a loophole by saying, well, in that case, we'll just buy sacrifices. And our heart was never changed. Isaiah, one of the prophets, actually said, you've just gotten so good at sacrificing, but your heart isn't changed uh, because of it. So we go through that sacrificial period, and then we get into the kings. Uh, man wanted kings. God was intended to be their leader. But they're like, we want to have kings like everybody else. So God gave them kings. There were some good kings, and there were some bad kings. Um, you go through that time and then to the bad kings, God put prophets in place who the prophets 
would speak to the kings on behalf of God. There's one thing, if you've studied the Bible long, you'll, you'll know there's a thing, there's major prophets and minor prophets. The minor prophets aren't less important, they're just, they said less than the major prophets. And I bet there's kind of this competition in heaven where, where, where the prophets, like, they see each other in the mess hall in heaven and they're, like, eating. I don't know if there is one, but you would think so. And he's like, he's like, hey, are you one of those major prophets? And Isaiah's like, yeah, I'm a major prophet. You know, and then, like, Amos is there fixing his meal and Isaiah's like, are you a major prophet or are you a minor prophet? He's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a minor prophet. And then Isaiah's like, whoa, chat, did you guys hear that? I mean, he's like, he's a minor prophet, not like me. I don't know if that happens, but I think it would. Um, and so you go through that, and then you get to the end, and there's 400 years of silence. Nothing. Now, you and I know during that time, God was moving the pieces into play for the coming of Jesus, that everything had to be perfect. And part of that, I believe, was the Roman Empire was spreading like wildfire, and we know that was probably a bad thing. But in the culture, it was the first place that would develop roads, and they would bring water into places, and they had this this technology that would help people live a little bit better lives. They had a police force system, which means you could now travel between cities, and, and yes, you would get robbed by some, but it wasn't nearly as rampant as it was. But the Bible says when the time was right, God sent Jesus into the world. I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, if you're a sports guy, it's kind of like God made an NIL deal with Jesus, right? And, you know, name, image, and likeness. God made an M-I-L, NIL deal with Jesus, and it was you. And so Jesus committed, and you were the prize. You were the one that Jesus came to save. After we get to that point, we're into what's called the Gospels. Now, I realize that there are people here, um, and the only reason you're here is because there's ham and mashed potatoes waiting for you, and you can't have that unless you go to church. You're like, fine, I'll go to church. Or um, you don't have that, and your wife bought you a cool shirt. She's like, you got to wear this to church. You're like, we're going to church. And so you're just here because you have to. And if, if that's you, you're my people. I understand that because you would look at the Bible, and you would say, eh, I believe some of it. I don't necessarily believe off of all of it. Some of it kind of seems far-fetched. And you would have all kinds of reason as to why. And, and I, I would be tracking with that. Some of that would make some sense because it's significant. You're like, I'm not going to give my life to something unless I know kind of what happened, unless I know it was that significant. Well, look at the Bible like this. The Bible is not the cornerstone of our faith. Now, let me say that, and then we're going to get back to what is the cornerstone in just a second. The Bible is not a book, but rather a collection of writings, specifically in the New Testament, from people that were there. So Matthew, he was an IRS agent in the first century. No one liked him, ended up being a follower of Jesus, and he wrote down what happened while he was following Jesus. John was the same way. John just wrote his account of, hey, when I followed Jesus, here's what happened. Another guy by the name of Luke. Uh, Luke was a doctor, and he had a rich friend, Theophilus. And Theophilus was like, I want to know more about this Jesus guy. And this was about-ish, 50 AD, somewhere around there. Much time had passed, and Theophilus is like, I want to know what the, all the fuss about this Jesus is. So Luke wrote an account and gathered all this information for this guy, Theophilus. Thus, we have the book of Luke. The book of Mark is a little bit different. Mark was on house arrest with a guy named Peter. So Mark wasn't really a disciple. He kind of followed Peter around in the second part of the, of the New Testament and uh, was a, became a follower of Jesus. And so Peter and Mark were on house arrest together in Rome. And they had so much time on their hands that Peter was, I think he may have known, I'm not leaving house arrest. And we find out that Peter actually dies in house arrest. They take his life there that he would never leave 
that area. Um, and before that, Peter's like, let's just get it all on paper. Mark's like, I'll write it down. And so Peter is, I can just almost see Peter sitting on a couch telling Mark, and Mark's just writing all this stuff down. Mark would actually leave Rome, take those letters to Alexandria, Egypt, and they would be circulated. Um, 300 years later, 350 years later in the fourth century, we would gather all of these letters and put them in the Bible. And so the Bible is a collection of just so many different people all pointing to the same subject, which is Jesus, um, written in different times, in different countries, by different people, but it all has the same theme. That's how we know about what happened with Jesus. And so that's important um, to our study. So for the past nine weeks, we've been looking at Peter's account to Mark, basically saying, Mark, let me tell you what happened. Um, as we, we were going through life, he says, when John, talking about John the Baptist, when he was put in prison, Jesus, he went into all of Galilee proclaiming the good news. To which you would say, what's the good news? What, what is that news? It's, it's a Greek word, euangelion. It, it means the gospel. And Peter would say that everywhere Jesus went, he talked about the good news. The next verse, um, he says, here was the good news. The time has come, that Jesus was saying, that the kingdom of God has come near, which means you're so close. So therefore, repent and believe the good news. Change your worldview because the kingdom of God is here. And Peter would say, Mark, just everywhere we went, that was his message. That the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. Which means we're so close to it and trying to change our worldview so that we can follow Jesus. And this was his story uh, throughout. One of the things when we left off last week, we were talking about the crucifixion. Um, we left off with this verse and I thought it was significant. In Mark chapter 15, verse 20, he says, And when they had mocked him, talking about Jesus, they stripped him of his purple cloak, and they put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Now, in this verse, that's pretty much all we get. We get a few more details from Peter, but that's, that's pretty much all we get on the crucifixion. And if you ever thought, why is that? Well, they didn't need any more details. They knew what crucifixion was. They had seen crucifixions. They had heard crucifixions. They had smelled crucifixions. They knew firsthand what a crucifixion was. And so Peter just tells Mark, they took him out and they crucified him. Here's the devastating truth for Peter and the other disciples. So they had left everything to follow Jesus. And now they had crucified Jesus and killed him. The devastating news is this, that when Jesus died, hope died. It, it was over. I mean, they had had a movement, right? They were drawing crowds. They had some momentum. Um, there were some good things happening. They were healing people. Toward the latter part, Peter would say to Mark, he would say, everywhere we went, crowds would come, and Jesus was healing, and there were some amazing things happening miracle after miracle and we just love being a part of it but it never really got off the ground because Jesus he died in in the scope of about a week um last week or the week before what we said was that that as they were making their journey to Jerusalem Jesus is trying to talk to his disciples three different times in one chapter Jesus says guys they're gonna they're gonna crucify me they're gonna kill me they're going to beat me, they're going to flog me, they're going to spit on me, and they're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise again three days later. And it's like they didn't even hear it because they would go on to other conversations. It's like it went in one ear and out the other. And so when Jesus died, literally all the hope that they had died. And here's why. This is why it's so important. They had thought, good Jewish people, that Abraham in the Old Testament was the Messiah, He's got to be. I mean, he's the one that God said, uh, on your offspring, I will build a mighty nation. But then you know what? Abraham died, and it was over. And then Joshua came along, and they're like, oh, okay, here it is, really. Joshua 
is going to be the Messiah. And, and there's just such a direct correlation between Joshua and Jesus and what it should have been like. Joshua is going to be the, the Messiah. Then Joshua died. And it was over. They thought the same thing about David, uh, King David. They even thought the same thing about Isaiah, that he might have been the Messiah, but then he died. And so Jesus comes along and Jesus teaches and they're like, yep, he's the Messiah and he dies. Can you see a trend from the beginning of all of these people that followed Yahweh, that followed God the Father, and now they followed Jesus and he died and it's over. Can you imagine how devastating that must have felt to them? How absolutely devastating that they'd given up everything and now Jesus is gone. And here's one thing we know for sure, um, that, that they thought Jesus was dead and they expected dead people to do what dead people do, and that's stay dead. Why? Because no one was expecting a resurrection. No one. There was not a single person that thought, oh, he's coming back to life. If so, if they would have heard what Jesus was teaching, they would have been outside the tomb looking, you know, waiting to see Jesus come back to life. No one was expecting a resurrection. Actually, just the opposite. Mark tells us in chapter 16, he said that when the Sabbath was passed, this is after Jesus had died, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salmon brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. That's a tradition. You anoint and you preserve, you help the body of a dead person. You don't anoint spices, you don't anoint people with spices if they're alive. So Mary and, and the girls went to the tomb expecting to see a dead body because that's what they had thought happened. They thought once Jesus died, all of the hope was totally gone because no one was expecting a resurrection. I made a little list, and you can imagine, when Jesus died, here's, here's what we were left with. We were left with corrupt religious leaders, right? They were the ones that ultimately had put Jesus to death. A ruthless empire in Rome. Power and authority that they were abusing, and it would only get worse. They would end up in 70 AD destroying Jerusalem, burning down the temple and blaming it all on the Christians. We have terrified apostles. They all disappeared. Peter actually tells Mark, he says, um, when this happened, everyone left. When Jesus was crucified, we all left. Everyone was gone. We have some despondent women. We have heartbroken Galileans. They had followed Jesus. They had seen Jesus do miracles, and now it's over. And now he's dead. And worse, we had empowered Roman soldiers. They felt like they had won. At this point, it could not have been any worse for a follower of Jesus. It was over. The hope was over. The movement was over. There was no Christianity because there was no Christ. It was done. But then something happened. And that is the cornerstone of our faith. The song says, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Then it says, out of the silence, like a roaring lion, proclaiming that the grave and the death has no claim on me. I love that song because it, 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 it punctuates, this is why we do what we do. This is why we celebrate Easter. This is why we celebrate Good Friday. This is why we stuff so many eggs for kids to have fun and to celebrate because we believe something happened and it was significant and it changed the world. Um, I was scrolling through a, a social media feed and my, uh, my algorithm is, is pretty crazy because some of it is like, I was going to say Blue's Clues, but that's not right. But there's like other, A is for Adley and some things because my daughter will occasionally watch some on my phone. But other times it, it's pretty good. There's a lot of uh, like North Sea shipping scary videos. I'm not sure how I'm onto that. I have some pirate videos, which that's kind of weird. I'm not sure how. But I got onto like Roman Catholic celebration TikTok, however that happens. I don't know how it happens, but here's what happens. In Rome, 
in, in the capital city in Rome, they do these celebrations where they have these massive statues um, and they're about as big as one whole seating section. And one of them was like Jesus on a cross. The other one was a tomb. I think the third one I saw was like the Last Supper, these massive things. And then underneath them, there's like 100, 150 guys carrying this and they do this little thing down the street and everyone's celebrating in Rome. And every time I see that, I think, y'all killed him, right? I mean, I, I know you're celebrating now, but you are the reason he's dead. And that makes you think, what in the world happened? What happened so that Rome would go from the ruthless Roman Empire to a culture that now is the, the center of Christianity in our world today? Something happened. And that was the resurrection of Jesus. Have you ever thought about this? It wasn't Jesus' teachings that started the movement. These 12 people plus maybe a couple others, you know, we could be a group of about 100 or 200 people was all that was left during the crucifixion. How did that group ultimately overthrow the Roman Empire and push everyone to faith in Jesus Christ? wasn't because of the teachings of Jesus. They were great, but it wasn't that. It wasn't because of the miracles of Jesus. They were countless. John even says there's more miracles. We don't even have time to talk about. All these things happened. What was it? What was it that would change an entire culture? It was the resurrection. And that's the significance. That's why we believe what we believe is because something significant happened that Jesus Christ was dead, buried, and then came back to life. And when people heard about it, it changed them forever. And so if you're one of those that you're like, yeah, I don't know that I believe all the stuff in the Bible, um, and, and you're just here because you want free lunch, I get that. But let me just challenge you. Let me push back a little bit. Ask yourself, ask yourself how that happened how the most powerful empire in the world, actually shortly after that, we see the fall of the Roman Empire. How did that empire who built on, on Caesar was God, not Jesus, how did that empire turn from that to the Christian capital of the world? The only explanation you can come up with is they saw a man that was dead come back to life and walk among them. One of the writers even says, Paul says, there's, there's like 500 of them that Jesus talked to. If you don't believe them, fact check me. Go ask them. Some of them are still alive. Go talk to them and they'll tell you about Jesus. It's the resurrection that changed everything. And I can almost see Peter would tell Mark, he would say, when I saw Jesus come back to life, it was at that point I knew everything he said was true. And and I had bought into it, but it became real to me when Jesus came back to life. And every one of these disciples had one message, that Jesus has risen. That was it. It wasn't his teachings. It wasn't his miracles. They were all great. But it was that Jesus had risen, and it turned the world upside down. So much so that you and I are a part of that movement 2,000 years later, because something significant happened. And the Bible is just a collection of stories from guys that were there and they saw it and they wrote down their accounts. And we believe not because the Bible says so, not because of the miracles, not because of the teaching, but because Jesus Christ came back to life. That's the significant of the resurrection. Here's where this gets interesting. Um, so you got the first three notes there filled in on your listening guide. Here's what the resurrection of Jesus did. We started off by saying sin fractured our relationship with God, but Jesus restored our relationship with God. It was Jesus was the one that fixed it. Remember in the beginning I said that um, while the Garden of Eden was still on fire, God says, I'm gonna redeem this. He's going to with Jesus. Jesus is going to restore that relationship we had with God. Uh, Mark chapter 15, 
Peter tells Mark, he says, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And then something crazy happened. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why is that significant? I mentioned earlier the day of atonement, meaning that the in order to be forgiven of your sins, you'd bring these sacrifices into the temple. Part of that procedure was the high priest would take the blood of those sacrifices and go through, I think, three different levels of the temple, but would get to this part that was a square part that was called the Holy of Holies. And that is where God dwelt with his people. And so a priest had to be perfectly right with God in order to enter in. He would enter into this Holy of Holies and he would take the blood of the altar and he would pour it over the atonement cover um, and it was God's way of forgiving the people. The problem was it was such a holy place that if you weren't totally right with God, these priests would die. It got to where eventually they would tie a rope around the waist of the priest or on his leg. They'd put bells on his robe that he would wear so that when the priest went into the temple, if God struck him dead, they would have a way to get him out. This is legit. I don't even understand how the first one happened, but you can almost imagine it's Tom's turn to go into the temple or into the Holy of Holies, and he's been in there for a few minutes. A couple hours have passed, and they're like, goodness gracious, what's happening? We don't hear any sound. They're like, hey, Tom, you okay? And they don't hear any answer. So they're like, we got to go get him. Is something wrong? And they're like, let's get Bob. Send Bob in there. Bob goes in, and we don't hear from Bob. Hours go by, and they're like, Bob, Tom, there's like no one. Finally, the last guy is like, I'm not going in. So then they get the other guy, and they tie a rope around him. And this, this, was, this, this went on for generations. You had to be right with God to enter the presence of God. And then in that moment, when Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn in two. You know what that means? That means now you don't need a priest to go to and be in the presence of God for you. That you have direct access into God. This is what Peter tells Mark of how Jesus restored that relationship. The next thing we said um, is we said that Jesus... Let me find my place here. That God declared judgment for our sins, but then Jesus received the judgment for our sins. Because where we started, God had to punish someone. Someone had to pay the price for our sins, and Jesus was the one who received the punishment that you and I were supposed to have. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once, for sins. One time that for Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us, me and you, to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. So through the sacrifice of Jesus, he not only restored that relationship, but he received our punishment. Here, here's why that's important to us. No one brought a lamb to Easter Sunday service. I mean, if you did, that's kind of weird. I'd like to see it, but that's kind of weird. No one brought a lamb to sacrifice. You weren't out there with with bulls or a dove and like, this is my sacrifice for the year. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because Christ already did it. Once and for all, he was the sacrifice that was absolutely perfect. And therefore, he received the judgment for our sin. The other thing we said was that God established a sacrificial system, but then Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial system. All of the stuff in the Old Testament, the first two-thirds of your Bible, all of the laws and the rules, Jesus didn't delete them. He just, he fulfilled them. He made them complete. It's why you and I don't have to sacrifice anymore. And when he came back to life, he literally conquered Death, and that's why it is so significant. He lived a perfect, sinless life. Look at, listen to the way that Colossians says it. This is Colossians is not just a book; it's Paul's letter to a church in Colossa, basically saying, "Here's how I want you to live 
now that you are followers of Jesus. And in that letter, he said, and you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our trespasses. That God forgave it, but that's not all. And by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. It's almost like Paul saying, you know the price for sin. There's law after law after law. And Jesus just canceled all of that and he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. It was finished. It was perfected. And he literally became the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. When he comes back to life, changes everything. Because now all of these other people that they thought were Messiah is not because they all died. Jesus, when he died, then he came back to life, sealing for all of eternity that he was the Messiah and it changed the entire Roman world, would eventually spill out into other cultures. And then years ago, some guys would get on a ship, come over to America and bring that same religious belief, bring that system with them, all because of a resurrected Jesus. All because Jesus came back to life. So for you and I, where does that leave us? What do, what do we do with that? Well, you and I have belittled his name. And so it's got to be dealt with. God's the creator of everything. So our sin has to be dealt with. So we, we like fail to give God thanks when he gives us stuff. Um, we question his rule and his authority. Have you ever thought, you know, I'm going to pray about something, but I'm really hoping God answers the prayer this way because I think it's best. I don't know how that works for you, but that never works for me that, that I don't know exactly what's best. I'm not God, but we question his rule. We rob God with the money that he's given us to manage, which is even crazier to think about. And we do it with a heart and mind that he gave us. If you believe God is your creator, then any sin against God is enough. Any sin against God separates you. And so without Jesus, you and I are left with this, this gap between where we are and between where God is. So we have two choices. Either you can pay the sacrifice for your sins. We talked about this in our Good Friday service. If you pay the sacrifice for your sins, it ends up in hell. That was God's first response right? Because we belittled his name, we sinned against God, and if we pay the sacrifice for that, then ultimately we die and spend an eternity separated from God. Or the second response is the cross of Jesus. We let Jesus pay for our sin debt. We let Jesus pay the debt that neither one of us could pay. There's no possible way we could enter into a relationship with God. This is why we called it good news, because it is good news. It's good news that you and I don't have to face the wrath of God. We can literally give that to Jesus, and he pays the price for our sins. So our bitterness, our envy, our anger, all of the things that we deal with, we can't fix those ourselves. If, if you know a friend, or maybe you are one that... Um, struggles with addiction or struggles with with sin there's something hard in their life man sometimes it's so hard to fix we can't we can't do that we can't resurrect anything we can't even fix our own life that's why jesus came not only and i heard a pastor say years ago and i just love this phrase he said you don't necessarily need a savior so that you may die today you also need a savior because you might have to live tomorrow and so Jesus comes and says, hey, if you're going to live in this world that I created, here are some things that you can follow that will help you live a better life. And how does he know that? Because he conquered death in the middle of it. That's good news. That's why Easter is still relevant. That's why Easter is still important because Jesus came back to life. And there's some of you, if, if you're like me, you may say, all right, I'll buy into that, but you're not willing to, to put your, your, your whole life into it because your thought is, um, until I believe everything, I'm not going to, until I understand how everything works, I'm not going to believe in anything. Well, 
Well, that doesn't make sense. Some of the things that's holding you back from being a follower of Jesus Christ might be, well, there's just stuff in the Bible that I don't know that I agree with. Or there's things in the Bible that I don't understand. I can promise you there's things in the Bible I don't understand. I have conversations with pastors on a regular basis. and We'll debate things and we'll leave that debate going, yeah, we don't really understand how that works. So in every other area of our life, we don't have to understand everything to believe something. Like, you believe in love, but how do you explain it? I mean, yeah, you don't understand all the parts about it. You, gravity is a thing that we all believe in, but we don't necessarily understand it. And so this is, this is what happens in the Christian faith. The evil one would not want nothing more than to say, oh, there's, there's doubt. We don't, we don't know about this. And then you'll get some self-proclaimed theologian that will do some two-minute video on why something's not true. And you're like, oh, I guess that might not be true. I think your heavenly father would look and say, where in your life do you have to understand every single thing before you believe something? I think he would turn that and he would say, here's what I want you to do. One small step of obedience. And the Bible says in Romans, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Saved from what? I mean, that's a church term, I understand. What will we be saved from? Saved from having to face the wrath of God ourselves. Letting Jesus take the wrath of God for us. One small step of obedience and God will show you the other things along the way. And that's the glory of the resurrection. That's why it's so important to us. So here's what I'd like for you to do. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I, I want to ask, if, if you're one of those, if you would be willing, I could think of no better time than Easter. If you'd be willing to say, God, I don't know that I understand all of it. There's still some things I have some questions about, but I believe that you were the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins, and I even believe that you rose again, and I don't understand how all of it worked, but, but I'm willing to take that first step and ask you to save me because I don't want the alternative. The alternative is you facing the wrath of God yourself. That ends up in hell. Who, who would want that? One of the things that I, I do is I, I constantly think what keeps people from giving their life to Jesus? I mean, yeah, churches are bad. Churches are broken. Churches do bad things. And yes, Christians are bad and Christians are broken and they can be hypocrites and they can do bad things. I, I understand all that, but that doesn't change the truth. The 2,000 years ago, something happened. Something significant happened. Something so significant that it would change an entire culture and would eventually spill over into just about every part of the globe. That's at least worth looking into. And so would you be willing to say, God, I don't understand it all, but I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose again and I'm asking you to forgive me, to take the wrath of God that technically should fall on me, absorbing it on yourself so that I can have my relationship with God fixed. I can think of no greater thing to do on Easter than to give your life to Jesus Christ. As I said just a minute ago, Romans says that if you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that God raised you from the dead, you would be saved. Right where you are, you can ask God to forgive you of your sins. You can ask God to, to be your Lord and master and to save you. And, and yeah, I know you don't understand all some of the stuff. And I know there's going to be things that you'll learn in the future. But God would say, let's take that first small step of obedience and allow Jesus to be your heavenly father. Be the greatest thing that you can do. And if you're here today and you have some other reason why you wouldn't, I would love to hear about it. You can write it on one of your blue cards or you can email or text or something. Just say, well, here's the reason why I don't because 
friend, I'll be honest, I'm left with nothing. With, with no good possible explanation. If you understand the might and the power and the wrath of God, there's no possible way any sane person would want to face that on their own. Hebrew says that even creation trembles at the thought of God. That God may snap and rip the universe into non-existence and it understands its power. And the Bible says that even the rocks will cry out in praise and worship. In the same way, shouldn't, shouldn't we understand the power of God? Jesus came so that you wouldn't have to face that wrath and to show you a better way to live. So I'm gonna pray out loud. And as I do, I would encourage you to do business with God this morning. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you'd be hard pressed to find a reason why you wouldn't right now. And yeah, you don't know what it all means. And yeah, we're not really clear on some things, but take a step of obedience to follow Jesus as your Lord and savior. God will show you the rest. God will change your life one degree at a time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and the image of, of Easter, the vision of the cross. God, it's amazing that how you would, in your infinite grace, your infinite mercy, that you would choose to sanctify, to, to forgive, to redeem a person like me with all of my sin, with all of my failures, that you would be the one that would be able to say through Jesus Christ, I'm forgiving the sins of Greg Payton and God, every person in this room. I pray that you reach down deep into the hearts of your people. Lord, let let us bring our excuses to you. Let us bring to you the things that, that may be holding us back. And my hope and prayer is that there would not be a single person here today that would ever miss the opportunity to give you our lives, to ask that you forgive us of our sins and to give us a home in heaven. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for once and for all, not, not Abraham, not Moses, not David, not Elijah, not Isaiah, not any of them. But only Jesus Christ has the claim of the Son of God who conquered death, which changes everything. God, I pray that every single person today would, would know the significance of the resurrection and it would change their outlook on the world. God, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for Jesus. For it's in his heavenly and precious name we pray. Amen.